We are good, hello. Thank you all for being here. Um, we're gonna talk, well, we're here to talk about the end of policing, both the book and the actual process. Um, and I'm, I'm Sarah Jaffe, I'm a reporter, I am a friend of variously all of the people on this panel, and mostly I cover labor, but also I cover social movements, which in this country means covering the cops. And so I'm here to MC this whole shindig, make sure we all have fun, and to start us off by talking a little bit about this book, which I have read and I have talked to Alex about, and I think all of you should buy, which you can do right over there, and tell all your friends to buy it, because among other things, um, this book, it does a lot. It kind of lays out where we are right now in terms of various forms of policing, various forms of quote unquote crime or social disorder that we think we need the police to deal with. And it also lays out the kinds of reforms that are popular, popularly being discussed around those things right now. And also why they won't work and why there are actually more important solutions that are bigger and broader than just reforms you can do to the cops and that actually involve reforming our entire society, which is a bigger, scarier job maybe than like hiring more local cops or hiring more cops of color or reforming our training programs for the cops, but are actually the only thing that's gonna work. And so, we have an excellent panel here tonight, including one panelist who is running late, but will be joining us in a little bit, um, who are gonna talk about the various kinds of policing that they have had experience with working around, covering as journalists, fighting as activists. And then Alex is gonna talk a little bit about his book, and then we'll take some questions from all of you. So, to start us off, person on this panel that I have known the longest, um, Melissa Jr. Grant and I went to high school together. She is a journalist covering criminal justice, among many, many other things. And I'm going to let her take it away. Thank you, Sarah. Is my mic on? I think all the mics should be on. Yeah. Can you all hear me? There we go. Okay, great. Yes, yeah, Sarah and I went to high school together, and, and we had some very interesting conversations about constitutional law as it pertains to students' rights to free expression, because we were both involved in underground student papers at our high school. So our, our journalism relationship runs deep. Um, so I'm Melissa Jira Grant, I'm a journalist uh, working right now with the Fair Punishment Project, uh, which is covering criminal justice issues. Uh, I am. I'm going to be continuing the coverage that I have been doing on sex work and trafficking, um, which I've also been writing about for The Village Voice and The Pacific Standard and Vice and many other publications. And I have a book um, on the policing of sex work called Playing the Whore, The Work of Sex Work, which yes, you can get over there. Thank you for Vanna Ng that for me. And um, this is something I've been writing about for at least 10 years at this point, and I discovered Alex's work just as I was getting into my book. His previous book, City of Disorder, uh, was really illuminating and in, in breaking into two separate categories, as Sarah did, questions of disorder and questions of crime and harm, and, and what it is when we have a police force that we have primarily empowered to fight um, and dispel visible representations of disorder, uh, what people think is disorderly, um, versus you know, what many people may think the function of the police is to keep people safe. And we know, this is probably not a surprise to this room, that the police don't do a good job at actually keeping people safe. And in fact, the police are often agents of egregious harm um, and operate with little accountability. So bringing that analysis into, into writing and reporting about sex work, um, it allowed me to see that the ways that we police prostitution are all about that, about you know, visible disorder. Um, certainly not everybody engaged in selling sex in New York uh, is policed. The people who are policed are the people who are the most visible. Uh, whether that's trans women working on the stroll in the Bronx, whether that's Latina women working uh, in Jackson Heights, whether that's immigrant women from Southeast Asia working in massage parlors um, that have a visible presence. Uh, this is the reality of decades of policing prostitution. It has created a, an urban reality for us where the people who have the least resources, the people who are the most exposed to the police are the ones who are going to suffer disproportionate policing. And I think we can see that's true across the board with all of these so-called kind of quality of life crimes. Um, one thing that I can't get off my mind and I'm gonna kind of throw into the center of our table as a point of 
uh, discussion today, and I haven't written about this yet, is um, the district attorney in Manhattan, Cy Vance Jr. And uh, yeah, <laughs> that's all fair. Um, and you know, it was enough last week to see a story uh, at, uh, by ProPublica, WNYC, and New Yorker reporters accounting his office and him in particular taking funds from the Trump organization while Ivanka and Donald Trump Jr. were facing a possible criminal fraud investigation for real estate shenanigans. I know, Trump's real estate shenanigans, <laughs> like breaking news. And, 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 it, and he was able to be bought off, and this might sound naive of me, but it, for very little money. <laughs> Right, like we're mid five figures is enough to get Cy Vance not to prosecute you. If you're a sex worker in Jamaica in, uh, in uh, Jackson Heights, you probably don't have 10K to give Cy Vance so that his office won't prosecute you. And, and for me, this is you know, not only a sort of story of the excesses of the Trumps, but of the disparate policing that we see and the, and the role of police in sort of feeding people into this very unequal uh, prosecutorial environment that we have where apparently Cy Vance is picking and choosing who's going to be prosecuted based on their power, influence, and cash, right? Today, we have another example. We have Harvey Weinstein, uh, who was caught on tape by a woman that he had groped. Um, she went back to see him, wearing a wire at the request of the NYPD, and got him on tape, admitting that he had groped her, and saying things that made it seem like this was a pattern of behavior for him, and threatening her on the tape, and Apparently, the district attorney, Cy Vance, believed that this wasn't enough for a prosecution. Coincidentally, he also took some money from Harvey Weinstein's lawyer. Um, it looks like pay for play. It looks like if you're powerful, you can avoid uh, these kinds of consequences of the criminal justice system. And, and this is a case where the police actually seemed like they wanted to do like the right thing and, and follow through on this. But it just brings into reality, a stark reality for me, that what the NYPD are actually doing day in and day out is not helping women who are survivors of sexual violence, as they may have in this case, what they are doing is they are arresting the most vulnerable people in our city. So at the same time as Cy Vance Jr.'s office is declining to prosecute Harvey Weinstein, despite having him on tape, at the same time as they're declining to prosecute Ivanka Trump and Donald Trump Jr., they are taking 326 cases of prostitution-related offenses in 2015. And the majority of those are women of color, cis and trans women. So that's apparently who Cy Vance is willing to prosecute that. And that has every to do with policing. The thing that, that, that really frustrates me as a journalist, going into these meetings at City Hall, talking to people who do public defense work, no one wants to talk about what the police are doing. You know, we'll monkey around and talk about what the courts are doing and sort of creating kinder, gentler alternatives to incarceration and all of this stuff, which I'm sure we'll all get into uh, with all the attendant eye rolling, um, because it's, it's a Band-Aid, right? If fundamentally the police are still going out and funneling people into the system, that's gonna create very dangerous consequences for them, no matter what we try to do on, on the other end. Um, the gravest consequence that I've seen in this post-Trump moment uh, it was this summer in June at the Queens Criminal Court where ICE agents showed up attempting to apprehend women who were there in the Human Trafficking Intervention Court. And I covered this for the Village Voice. Uh, what had happened is these women were arrested in prostitution policing operations targeting the Asian massage parlors in Queens. And ICE targeted this courtroom because they rightfully assumed that there would be many immigrants because that's who tends to get arrested uh, in Queens for prostitution. And the women who were there, it's worth saying, even though it's called a human trafficking intervention court, this is one of those kinder, gentler sort of renamings of the criminal justice system. The, the operation of the human trafficking court is not you know, where a judge and prosecutors and public defenders come together and help people who are victims of human trafficking or prosecute cases of human trafficking. What they do is they take people arrested for prostitution presume that they are victims of human trafficking and tell them that they can avoid going to prison if they attend therapy sessions, uh, which as you all know, will definitely ameliorate all of the reasons they may have been involved in prostitution in the first place, right? Um, Self-esteem can pay the rent now. So it's, it, it's, it, sorry. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, now we're in a very different moment. The consequences of being arrested and put into the system, the stakes are only higher. And we have women who, it's, this is a misdemeanor prostitution. And they're standing with their attorneys. And ICE is t standing there saying, we can take them. And 
once you're in immigration proceedings, those attorneys can't do anything for them. This is a civil process. They actually do have no uh, guaranteed counsel or representation in that process. The attorneys that I talked to, the public defenders, said it's like disappearing into a black hole. And that is because of the NYPD, right? That's why those women were in the courtroom in the first place. And there, you know, there was a fantastic uh, cast of characters at City Hall a few weeks after that protesting what the NYPD, or rather protesting what ICE had done, um, and talking about how terrible it is that ICE were in our courts trying to apprehend these victims of human trafficking, and that's just disgusting that we would arrest victims of human trafficking, because most people assume that you're in a human trafficking court, you're a victim of human trafficking. That's the point. And, um, but that's, we arrest quote unquote victims of human trafficking, both real ones and presumed ones, routinely in this city. And that was not a conversation that the otherwise well-meaning folks in the city council were willing to have that day. So I hope that they read your book. I hope that they remain in conversation with people who are willing to go to the root cause of this, which is what the police are doing in our city. So Melissa just got it a couple of chapters in this book. One is sex work policing. One is immigration and border policing. Um, there are, of course, several other chapters and sections here. So I'm going to throw this over to Dante Barry of Million Hoodies, which goes back, for those of you who don't remember, to the killing of Trayvon Martin. So, Dante. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Alex, for inviting me. Um, so we're going to do a little exercise to kick this off. So I want everyone to close their eyes and to imagine what makes them, what makes you feel safe? Um, where are you? Who are you with? What does it feel like? What does it taste like? What does it smell like? And just like imagine what, what really keeps you safe, what grounds you in safety. Okay, open your eyes. Uh, with a show of hands, if Police came into your mind, raise your hand. Once or twice. Okay. Usually that doesn't happen. Um, raise your hand if prisons came into your mind. Detention centers? Surveillance cameras? Great. Um, raise your hand if having a bed came into your mind or <laughs> Having food came into your mind, or having your loved one right next to you, or having a house. Yeah. So for those that are watching, a lot of people raised their hand after, on the latter <laughs> questions. Um, yeah, so society has taught, told us right, that all those things makes us feel safe. Right? Prisons, police, surveillance cameras, detention centers. We can go the whole gamut of all the things that, that society has told us that makes us feel safe. So at what point? do we begin to manifest what actually makes us feel safe, right? The things that y'all raised your hands for, having a house, having good jobs, having uh, a quality education, all of those things, right? And so um, I run an organization called Million Hoodies Movement for Justice. Um, we started after the death of Trayvon Martin in 2012. And the fundamentally, the question that we were asking when Trayvon was killed was who has the right to feel and be safe in this country, right? And that right is often negated around power, right? Who has the power to feel and be safe, right? And so a lot of our work has stems in, in response to vigilante violence and police killings, um, but also, but broadening of that is really encompassing of this reimagining of what safety really looks like. And how do we b uh, build systems that uh, that are away from harmful institutions and to connect us into more transformative, liberatory types of systems. And I think a lot of what um, Alex's book is about, The End of Policing, is, is yes, an, an argument for abolition, and that's always about like the dismantling of, but abolition is also about the building of, right? Building up something new. And so how do we also take in this conversation around the end of policing to tra translate that from away from harmful institutions to things that actually makes us feel safe. Um, and I, I want to kind of touch on um, a, key, a couple key things as it relates to 
um, Alex's book and, and a lot of the other things that kind of been brought up um, through our work. Um, I think one of the things that folks don't really understand is that the history of policing, and Alex does a really good job that I actually kind of learned from, of like actually not just learning from the history of policing connected to slave patrols and slavery, but extending that further in terms of like uh, Ireland and Texas Rangers, and like there's a whole history of, 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 of subjugation and exploitation and other criminalization that really has been about property, right? And the value of, of people being de denoted as property and, and capitalized off of that. Um, but I, I also want to kind of move a little bit further into this, right? That we got our work started, um, obviously, after the death of, my, of, of Trayvon. But after Mike Brown, I think we saw a wave of <laughs> activism that has came out of in terms of black movement, right? Um, in 2014, and I like I, I organized here in New York City, and I also um, uh, we have chapters in different parts of the country, and I have relationships in St. Louis, and I had spent some time in St. Louis right after Mike Brown was killed, um, and I, I want to kind of contextualize this in terms of both some of the work that we do around police militarization, and then also just the, the way in which police occupy black communities specifically, right? Um, there's a moment um, about a couple, we a couple weeks after Mike Brown was shot and killed, and, and this was like when uh, there was tons of media, tons of, uh, uh, like, tons of cameras on floor, uh, West Florissant and, and St. Louis and Ferguson. And every night, uh, black folks were out in the street protesting, every day, really, all day long. Um, and then at night, the police uh, like <laughs> created a false cur curfew um, at midnight um, in which um, you were no longer allowed to be in the street. Um, and if you were found to be uh, in the street, they would arrest you randomly. Um, they also instilled a two second or a five second walking rule, which meant like, I'm not even lying, I'm not even lying, I'm not lying. Where you would walk, or and and like you have to keep walking, but like if you're standing for like five seconds, they would arrest you, just like snatch you up and arrest you, um, under no like no reason at all, right? Um, and one of the other types of experiences that you had was that they separated separated all the black folks from all the non-black folks. <laughs> Um, and pushed out all the non-black folks away from the crowd, um, including media. And if you're a media and black, you're just black. Um, and there was moments in that, in that, that, that experience that like, you saw tanks, you saw armored cars, you saw I was tear gas, like people literally like, flushing out people's eyes in the middle of the street. Um, and, and so all of, all of America, all of the world saw the, uh, the militarization of police, which is actually not just necessarily happens when, when black folks stand up and resist in, in face of injustice, but when we look at the war on drugs and we look at the, the war on crime, right, that like through SWAT teams coming into our communities, that this, what, what America saw, or what the world saw, was just a microcosm of what actually happens every single day in black communities under severe uh, political and social control, right? And so um, that, that's really critical to the work that we do. Um, and one of the, the key aspects around police militarization um, that we're, we're also focused on, um, particularly as it relates to even in this moment around Trump, that um, Obama, like a couple years ago, lifted up the restrictions on um, 1033, which was the military surplus that it, it allowed local police departments to have uh, military grade weaponry, like allowing Ferguson Police Department to have that access of what of weapons in their their police department. That also extends to college campuses and about 20 different school districts, high school <laughs> districts, that are also enabled to have <laughs> military grade weapons in their <laughs> schools. Um, well, I don't know, but um, yeah. So like this, this is a lot bigger and a lot more entrenched in terms of how we actually live our day to day. Um, and then I want to kind of quickly like like transition a little bit into this larger thing around, and I think this is very timely again 
around the black identity extremist. <laughs> um, right, what a good time to have a conversation about the end of policing. Um, yeah, so obviously we've heard also in the news, right, that, um, that in 2016, um, the FBI has started to categorize um, black folks, uh, people that really were, that, they, that, they, that scared the FBI, black folks that scared the FBI, um, that black identity extremists, right, in response to one, black folks taking action and actually trying to build political power in this country, right, and being, and being one of the transform, most transformative movements that we've seen in our lifetime. And, and then also at the same time, at the, and the end of that, right, we have white nationalists and white supremacists like, like emerging at full force and also not being surveilled and at the level of uh, intensity as black folks are in this country right now, right? And so I, I think this all fits in a realm of like when we think about safety, when we think about policing, this extends to, to all of these different pieces. And I like to think about, and I'll close with this, but I like to think, think about I like to think about policing and criminalization as like a three-legged stool, right? We have poli policing, uh, detention, or four, three-legged stool, and I'm making this up. <laughs> so three-legged stool, right? Yeah, policing, and I, I would also include incarceration and detention, and then surveillance, right? And if you cut off one, you still have the other two still going, so you have to cut them all off at the same time to make sure that you like end policing and then criminalization. So. So, yeah, that actually made me go into my notes from this book where I have, there's a couple moments where Alex phrases this mm -hmm. same sentiment in a few different ways, but um, where he writes, the origins and function of the police are intimately tied to the management of inequalities of race and class. And that's, I mean, that is what I would say is at the heart of this book, and it's at the heart of the bigger, scarier struggle that we have to have around policing, I think. And I think so far our first two speakers have done a great job of illuminating that. And I think our third speaker will also do a great job of this. So Keegan <laughs> is a writer, an organizer, soon to be a lawyer. Yeah, I'm a law student. Currently. So um, you're going to be coming at this from all sorts of angles, I think. Um, yes. Yeah, so so <laughs> hi, everyone. Yeah, my name's Keegan. I've been a, a political organizer and writer in the city for like 10 years. And now I'm, I'm in law school. I'm uh, working at the Innocence Project, um, and I'm at Cardozo, I'm at 2L. Um, <clears throat> first of all, uh, I also want to highly, highly recommend the book. Um, you know, I spend all my time thinking and writing and reading about uh, police and police abolition, and this actually, uh, you know, really helped my analysis. I'm working on a law review article at the moment, and this uh, it came through for me in a lot of ways. <laughs> Helps me break down my legal analysis of things. Um, you know, it, it goes into, as, as the other speakers have mentioned, it, it goes into different parts of policing, different like specific areas where we police things like uh, sex work and political policing and gang policing. And it, I, you know, it looks at each one of them uh, and it looks at the failings, um, you know, the, the constitutional failings, um, the failings uh, to uphold equal protection, um, the, uh, the, the failings of just police brutality, um, the failings of racism uh, in that type of policing. And then it looks at um, you know reform me reform measures uh, that we could take and shows that they always fail. Um, you know they fail to address the equal protection problems because uh, the next form of policing to address that same problem is just as racist and just as flawed and just as violent. And that comes down to the the, the reason that has been mentioned a few times, which is policing is just never going to address the root cause of uh, crime or disorder uh, or any of the things that we're trying to alleviate with with policing. Uh, you know. We can, we can now, I think most of us can look at uh, crime uh, and realize that it, it largely comes from poverty. Uh, and we're gonna address, we're gonna address poverty and the, the root cause of crime with housing uh, and education and jobs, uh, not policing. You know, Policing just reinforces this racist uh, caste structure that creates all of these problems and it makes them worse. Uh, it makes it harder to get a job. It makes it harder to get housing and um, all that. So, um, yeah, the, the book, uh, by, by tracing those threads, I think, in all these different forms of policing and showing the, br the breakdown and how reforms will not fix each type of policing really, uh, I think, makes police abolition uh, as a whole a bit more 
it makes it seem practical, uh, you know, rather than like, I think a lot of people hear police abolition and recoil. Um, yeah. Yeah. But the book as a whole, when addressing, you know, each type of policing makes it seem, uh, it makes it seem palatable and practical. And it makes, it made me realize, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't say it in so many words, but it's like, yeah. if we're not working toward abolishing the police because we've addressed the underlying causes of crime, like, what are we doing? Uh, <laughs> um, we're, we're totally failing as a society. Um, and so I was asked to uh, talk about political policing uh, in particular. Um, and in some ways, I think I have the easiest uh, task there because <laughs> um, I think political policing is something that a lot of people are sort of realizing is illegitimate um, on its face. Um, you know, we look at the policing of the civil rights movement. Uh, we look at, you know, just obviously attacking uh, brutally in the streets, uh, peaceful demonstrators, um, sending undercovers in to disrupt the movement, um, all the things that, that happened in the civil rights movement, you know, everybody looks at now and it's like, oh, that was bad. Uh, that's illegitimate policing. Um, you know, even the FBI, uh, you know, will tweet out for MLK Day. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, so in my work as an organizer, uh, you know, through Critical Mass and Occupy Wall Street and now Black Lives Matter, uh, part of my role has been looking at the policing, documenting the police, uh, filing freedom of information requests to figure out, you know, what the, the police are doing in these movements and the exact same stuff that was going on in the civil rights movement is going on now. Um, so we see, we see the analysis that, um, that Alex <clears throat> applies to all these different forms of policing playing out in policing from the 1960s to now. Uh, you know, we, we realized things were bad. We tried to impose some reforms. Um, some of those reforms were freedom of information, uh, but freedom of information like that exists now, basically, uh, because of COINTELPRO, mm -hmm. um, because we decided that was bad and we didn't let that happen again. We wanted open records. Mm -hmm. Try to foil the police department and get some records right. on their political policing. You're not gonna get <laughs> it until <laughs> way, way after the fact. Um, we tried, you know, we, we, mm -hmm. we said we're not gonna, you know, beat people up in the street. We're beating people up in the street. We said we're not gonna send an informants. We're sending in informants. Um, you know, just a couple examples of that. Um, you know, I think I think you know most people can look now at the political p policing in the 1960s and be like, why would you send an under a deep undercover into a protest movement that is obviously demonstrably peaceful, um, and uh, you know have them disrupt um, and agitate? Um, you know that shouldn't be done. I think you know most people could agree on that now. Uh, we had the Occupy Wall Street movement, uh, demonstrably peaceful movement, and we had this guy Albert. Uh, he was stationed at sanitation at Occupy Wall Street. Uh, I was at the sustainability working group. I borrowed a broom from Albert. Uh, he came to birthday parties of, I think, people in this room. Uh, and uh, a couple years later, he came on a bike ride that I organized. Um, it turned out Albert this whole time was an undercover cop. Uh, and that was exposed because uh, he was um, on another undercover mission, uh, 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 policing a, a motorcycle group on a group ride. And he smashed a window out of an SUV that resulted in this brutal beating. Uh, of someone, and um, you know, he ended up getting fired from the police force and whatnot. But this is a guy that was, uh, you know, in Occupy Wall Street uh, on peaceful bike rides, at, and then so deep undercover that he was at our birthday parties. Um, and you know, we've we've seen the same thing with you know religious groups. You don't even need to be involved in the police get this form of um, policing going on. And then in the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, we've seen the same thing. It's really hard to get these records, as I said, but but we're seeing it again. Um, I, I did get some records through a freedom of information lawsuit um, that a, a lawyer here was working on, MJ. Um, and uh, you know, we got we got we got communications between NYPD undercovers and their handlers saying things like, uh, "I'm going to the protest with a couple other organizers." Um, you know, it demonstrated that they are very deep undercover, uh, that they're going to the protest with us, so are infiltrating our circles, and these are demonstrably peaceful organizations. So, for someone to be there with a disingenuous purpose already will start to disrupt. Uh, and then to look at that person and think, uh, to think that they're not also disrupting in a more active way when they've already identified us as like an enemy um, is, any, is naive, I think. Um, so, you know, they're there, they're still doing the same policing and it's not working to, uh, it's not working to reform. Um, you know, and then that's why, you know, uh, 
abolition is the only thing that's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think I, I think I have the easier uh, argument to uh, with policing because you know I think we we all realize we can get rid of that, right? The things that we think of as like legitimate uh, policing of protests is like crowd control and things like that. But you know, we got to get rid of this ridiculous structure of um, you know the political policing. But the the like underlying cause of of why we're we're policing uh, politics so heavily is uh, you know not because we don't want marches in the street. You know, we permit marches on Washington every day. Um, but it's, it's when the protest starts to uh, attack that rac uh, mm -hmm. racialized caste system mm -hmm. that it becomes really problematic and they really start mm -hmm. to crack down. And so it's, it's attenuated in this way. We're not, um, you know, it's, there's not a crime of poverty that the police are attacking. So people are like, okay with that. They're like, oh, you know, yeah, like there's no crime going on here. Stop policing the protest. But, uh, the same tactics that are being used on the protesters are what are used on those crimes of poverty. For example, the, the um, people that were arrested at the inauguration are now facing really, really serious charges. Yep. Uh, some of them are facing up to 75 years in jail for uh, a conspiracy to break a window. <laughs> um, and the reason that they're facing these heavy charges is there was massive surveillance that went on, and the massive surveillance was used to build this case of conspiracy to destroy property, and they, they really think that they're gonna get away with this, so they're gonna be able to prosecute this case and put these people away for 75 years. Um, the only reason they can build that case and make it look legitimate to the law is because of this intense surveillance that they've used to criminalize this community because they don't want the racial caste system to change. But that happens every day in communities of color, and that's why people are demonstrating. In communities of color, which Joe Zmar will talk about if he shows up here, but I'm, I'm researching right now gang policing also, and. They are just heavily surveilling, uh, surveilling communities of color. They use this heavy, heavy surveillance to build cases that are utterly illegitimate. Um, they end up charging people with conspiracy to possess marijuana, uh, which obviously, you know, you could stand outside of a fish concert and arrest every white person leaving uh, and bust them for conspiracy uh, to possess marijuana. But they're putting uh, people uh, of color away for this for two to four years, even in New York City where it's decriminalized because they're handing the cases over to the feds after they've built them with the surveillance mechanism. And that's, uh, that's at the root cause of this. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's easy to say we should abolish the political policing, but we've really got to abolish the policing that we're, that the, that the uh, political protesters are, are uh, demonstrating against. And just the last thing on, um, you know, why, why the reform mechanisms won't work is um, there's just, you know, we need the money to address these problems. We need the money that's going into ha to policing and incarceration and the military to address the problems of housing, uh, to address the problems of education and jobs. And as long as the money is locked in the system that is reactionary, um, that is constitutionally bound to only, you know, prosecute crime, um, and that is historically uh, racist and uh, there to enforce the caste system, it's going to be stuck there. We're not going to get it out. We're not going to distribute it anywhere. And so, you know, reforming it uh, in little bits and ways isn't going to work. It has to be abolished and redistributed. So I'm going to riff for a couple seconds, just hoping that Joe Smart like gets <laughs> off of the hell train. I had hell subway getting here. I don't know if everybody else did. Like the credit card thing in the machines was down today, yeah. and I didn't have any cash on me. It was a mess. Mm -hmm. um, Could we take a moment to greet the members of law enforcement who may be listening to us, <laughs> who are in the room or elsewhere Hi. on the live stream? Hello. Thank you for <laughs> joining us. Hi, the book. So, yeah, I mean, I was thinking about, while Keegan was talking, I was thinking about the, the sort of women's march moment this year. And one of the things that happened after the women's march, there were a couple of things that happened. But one of them was that there was a sort of self-congratulatory, like, nobody was arrested. Yeah. And the like, thank the police for not arresting us. And I was like, that is not OK. <laughs> because that is the reason that nobody was arrested at this march mm -hmm. is not because nobody did any of the same things that were done the day before, or at any other mm -hmm. political protest. Um, and one of the things that I think um, Keegan could probably talk about for a lot longer if I was going to throw this back at him, um, is that during Occupy, a lot of people who might have originally had that reaction, right? one of the early chants at Occupy was police are the 99%. That didn't last very long. <laughs> and it didn't last very long because for people to suddenly be surveilled all day long and be sort of abused by police in a way that they had never been, made them start to think about like, oh, this happens to other people all the time. 
And that actually helped lay some groundwork for the movement against stop and frisk in this city, which leads me to the other thing I was going to riff on while we are waiting on Joe's to hopefully get off the train. So we had another spectacular mass shooting in this country recently. And with that comes attendant calls for gun control. And one of the people who runs one of the biggest gun control organizations in this country <laughs> is our former three-term mayor billionaire <laughs> Michael Bloomberg, whose idea of gun control is, wait for it, who's going to answer me? Stopping and frisking black and brown young men. And so when we start to think about these things, when we start to come at thinking about police with the kind of framework that Alex puts forward in this book, we actually start to question like, oh, there actually isn't a gun control framework that's been put forward easily that doesn't involve the cops yep. and that doesn't involve stopping and frisking what is going to end up being more black and brown young people. And so this is yet another reason why I think this book is important. Joe Smart might be stuck on a train somewhere. So Alex, I think you're going to have to talk because people are going to get sick of me real quick. I'll just channel him for a few minutes. Let me, I mean, <laughs> it's pretty to, tough. He's I pretty... A little bit also. <laughs> anyway, if he comes in, we'll let yeah, him talk. Yeah, but um, Hopefully so. Hopefully so. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And one of the most amazing things for me about the last several years is to get to know so many amazing journalists and activists who, uh, who had been laboring away, but there wasn't the public attention. I wasn't becoming aware of their work. And I, it's been my mission to make these connections as concrete and to work across the normal lines that we often see in this work. So uh, thank you so much uh, for reading the book, for thinking about it. For, for saying such nice things. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. I also want to thank uh, the folks at Verso. Andy um, asked me to have lunch with him about four plus years ago to talk me into writing a book about the NYPD. Now, this was just before the last mayoral election, four years ago. And I said I was the first academic in the history of academia who went to a meeting with a publisher to talk him out of a book idea. And I said, what I, what I, I don't want to write a history book. There are going to be big changes in the NYPD. And I said, what I'd like to do is to write a book that interrogates different forms of policing and shows you know, what a terrible idea they are. We don't need nicer school police. We don't need school police to be mentors. We don't need school police to have better military hardware. The whole premise of school policing is fundamentally misguided, unjust, ineffective, and expensive. And there are alternatives. We can look at restorative justice programs. We can look at doing something about the incredible segregation of our educational system. We can look at community schools models out there. And all of these things will make kids safer than keeping armed police around them. Uh, so let me stop there. <laughs> Sarah will introduce Joe yes. Smar, who will. Well, I mean, you might as well just. <laughs> yes. So I'll say about Joe Smar that uh, I got to know Joe Smar because he was trolling me. <laughs> <laughs> Which puts me in pretty good company. And uh, I, you know, he was like, who is this uh, middle class academic telling us about policing and what should be done with policing? Why aren't you out there getting arrested? And he, he obviously did not know much about me. And uh, so I had to disabuse him of some of these ideas over drinks one night. And since then, we've worked together on a whole bunch of projects. And I, I hope you'll tell folks a little bit about the, the work we're doing on the gang conspiracy cases. So. Your mic should be live, dear. Um, yeah, I'm a little earlier than I usually am, so <laughs> sorry for uh, keeping everyone waiting. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I, I have to start out by saying, you know, I'm kind of well known for being the guy who says, like, we don't need, like, more white people telling us like what's going on and all this stuff and and when um, 
you know, and actually, I've, I actually took a vow to, like, like really, like, <laughs> take a really solid stand on making sure, um, you know, I don't uh, help any white reporters or white writers out in the world. <laughs> However, I saw that, <laughs> obviously I'm here, so. <laughs> I saw that uh, uh, Juan Gonzalez wrote a book talking about Bill de Blasio is leading a, a national movement against the tale of two cities. So then I said, Alex, I gotta help you get your book sales up because we can't let, we can't let that be the number one bookseller right now because that is not true. Bill de Blasio is not doing all this uh, amazing work. Um, so no, in all seriousness, um, this book, the just even just looking at it, like the end of policing, is so important for not just street organizers, not just you know people on the left, people who come to panels like this, uh, people who write about this for a living, people who speak about this for a living, but also just for us in this time that we're having all this craziness with Jerry Jones and Colin Kaepernick and all this stuff going on, uh, and how the conversation is becoming all this crazy, Trump-inspired nonsense that's going on, it's like refocusing us to back to what needs to happen, which is we need to go after the power mm -hmm. of police and the unmitigated uh, leverage that they hold in communities of color. Mm -hmm. So when we, uh, so I, I'm part of a coalition of about a dozen groups called the Coalition and Broken Windows. A lot of them you may have heard of, El Grito de Sunset Park, Cop Watch Patrol Unit, uh, Y Accountability, uh, Queens Barrios Unidos, a lot of, uh, grassroots organizations from everyday people who've been doing work around their community specifically, but also around policing for years and years and years. And when we talked about broken windows years ago before it started to become like this issue that Brooklyn district attorneys were taking, you know, were talking about. And um, you, you know, you had, uh, at one point I think, you know, Malcolm Gladwell, the guy who really helped push forward the idea of broken windows, he kind of did, did a makulpa a few years ago, and he said, oh, I, I think I was wrong about this. Like, we changed the conversation, not just we, but all of the activists, all of the people. Eric Garner, unfortunately, had to lose his life over, over, over this. And all of this work happened all this time, and the marching and all that stuff, but we said broken windows can only go away when we get, get rid of unnecessary policing, and policing as the end all be all of everything that we turn to when we have problems in our communities or in our society. And so we wanted to make issues like the addition to the NYPD headcount uh, two years ago, a big fight for us. We wanted to make the issue about the NYPD budget, mm -hmm. bigger than North Korea's budget, mm -hmm. bigger than all of you know, the mm -hmm. GDPs of entire countries. We wanted to get back to what actually the NYPD's resources, budget, power, all of that leads back to like those substantive things, not just like did this cop like say something really fucked up, or does the NYPD have you know not hire enough black the, uh, officers? Like all of that is like mm -hmm. side stuff compared to the main mm -hmm. issue that we want to take on, which is the power mm -hmm. and the size and the scope mm -hmm. of police, and then what they do with that power, right? They don't have they don't add 1,300 cops because they you know they're telling you guys mm -hmm. they want to do neighborhood policing. I mean that's I mean. Take two seconds to think about that. Look at, look, at, look at what's going on in the streets and you understand that's PR spin. To take your eyes off of the prize of the fact that they're adding you know, all sorts of surveillance uh, to, uh, infrastructure, all sorts of uh, you know, uh, predictive policing algorithms, like, uh, like crazy stuff that you know, the person on the street like, doesn't even know that, that's going on. So while this is happening, we have to have that conversation that says, no, not only do we not want an increase in policing, do not, we don't want to give them more power, but we actually want to go the opposite direction. We want to diminish them, we want to take away responsibilities that they don't need. Um, we, and the goal, right, the end goal is the end of policing. That's the goal. And so sometimes people come say, oh, they know, that's, how, you know, how can you live in a world without police? And, what, what, what? and so, again, this whole thing about abolishing police or getting rid of police, I've always seen it, and I'm not a super, you know, smart person, I guess, by academic standards. And, but I'm, I'm well enough aware to understand that we have to set a goal of getting rid yep. of them in our lives to the extent that we can. And so whether you want to say no police or abolishing police or however you want to put the end goal, that has to be something that we're always striving towards. Yep. And that means we don't get caught up into the conversations yep. about nicer police, as yep. Alex has, yep. has said. We don't get into conversations about diversity of yep. police not completely unimportant, but that's not the point. So we get back to the idea of how do we slowly eradicate their presence in our communities? Because to me, as I've always understood it, broken windows is 
academically debated thing. It's, it's constant contact with people who are brown or black. It's constant contact in our lives for every transgression. And now you have all sorts of technological um, advances over the last 10, 15, 20 years that are giving them even more intimate uh, kind of uh, intimacy into our lives, into our, you know, our, our, our behaviors online. Um, the gang uh, conspiracy stuff, uh, I can tell you the, the work we've been doing with Alex is all about how police are using social media to track people. They don't even need to be in our lives to be in our lives, you know? And then the stuff that they do with that is outrageous. I mean, I, we'd have an entire five hour discussion, maybe a two day, work, a two -day thing. I think that's coming We're up. We're working right? on yeah, that, yeah. Okay. So just to talk about just the gang enforcement stuff that they're doing with social media. So as all this stuff is, is you know, the NYPD, think about it incredibly, after all of this stuff, they're actually gaining resources because of the mayor mm -hmm. and the city council in the city. So we as street organizers, as activists, as whatever we want to call ourselves, have to shift that conversation back to no, this doesn't need to be a police responsibility. This, this doesn't need to be a police responsibility. And on top of that, the history of policing tells us that anytime that you give them more resources and more power and more budget, they do what they do. Right. And history, I, I mean, like, we don't need to prove this anymore. Like we're at the point where we don't have to like talk right. about these issues anymore. Right. It's like, now what are we gonna do about it? Right. And if the end of policing, if you can put all of the problems of policing into one line and you say, the end of policing, it may be very radical for folks, it may be very, you know, pie in the sky for some other people, but there has to be an end goal that we as organizers are working towards. And that's the one that I think is the most important one. Mm -hmm. um, much more important than even necessarily uh, putting cops in jail, mm -hmm. I think is actually just yep. reducing their presence in our lives. So we don't have to march for another hashtag. We don't have to release another, you know, mm -hmm. um, um, put a, uh, a, you know, a, a protest for. We have to have something tangible, which is the end of policing, as Alice Book says, or in my case, is just having them like not have their foot on our throats every single day. Because what happens is I've been around, I'm just old enough to remember the stuff from the 90s. I remember all the stuff that happened during the Giuliani era and all that stuff. Um, and so some of this to me is starting to become cyclical, right? Like I see it happening again, the protests, and they come back, and then the reforms, and then this mm -hmm. and that. And it's like Groundhog Day. It's like you're back, back in the same thing. You wake up and you go, oh, I've been here before. And so I don't want to be here anymore. And I don't want my kids to be here anymore. And I don't want their kids to be here anymore. And so we have to have like, this kind of vision for the future. And I think that the book comes at the, at the, uh, at the, I think at the per perfect time. Thank you. Yay, thank you. All right, Alex, So let bring me just home. finish some thank yous. I wanted to uh, so thank Andy for bearing with my little change up in that lunch four years ago. And, um, you know, it took so long because I, uh, this, you know, this lunch happened before Mike Brown. It happened before mm -hmm. Eric Garner. And mm -hmm. that stuff happened shortly afterwards. Mm -hmm as I was beginning to outline and think about the book and I had a kind of strategic decision to make. Do I double down on trying to get the book done as quickly as possible, which is, which is like a year, plus a year of post-production, or do I get into the conversation right now? When the issue is hot, when people are looking for answers, when there's, you know, we know like with our students that when they ask a good question, they're ready to hear an answer. And everybody was asking questions, and I felt like I had something to say about a lot of these things. So I took like two years and just wrote op-eds and essays like one a week for two years, which allowed me to try out ideas, mobilize some of the research that was being collected for individual chapters, and also to build an audience for the book, I think. And, and I think that that turned out to be a good decision. And the police have kindly enough kept the issue alive for us <laughs> by continuing to kill people in egregious circumstances that were 100% avoidable, yeah. whether or not they were against the law, sure. which unfortunately often it's not against the law. And putting cops in prison is never going to be the solution to our problem here. Um, and the book does not ask us to imagine a world without police in some abstract sense, 
What it asks us is to imagine how we would like to produce public safety mm -hmm. in the way that Dante got us starting to think about. And what I sometimes say is, imagine you live in a community that has very real crime and disorder problems, and instead of just relying on the police, imagine that you actually had a process where all the resources of government, the resources of the community were at the table mm -hmm. on an equal basis mm -hmm. to try to figure out a solution to those problems. And we could have some principles to help guide that process, that the things we choose should be cost effective. They should work, and they should work at the lowest reasonable cost. They should be lawful. They should be done within a legal constitutional framework, and they should treat people with as much dignity as possible. And if we did that, the answer would almost never be more police. But we do exactly the opposite. We tell communities that all problems must be defined in terms of a solution that the police can provide. But policing must always be understood as the most problematic, most coercive, most punitive aspect of the state. And we should always rely on them as a last, last resort, not the first resort. So thank you again so much for coming. And I think we'll take a few questions and have a drink. Hey, we all like to have a drink. Um, I totally want to take my MC's privilege right here and ask a question to Alex, but also I would love to hear if anybody else on this panel wants to jump in. We have talked a lot about sort of crime versus disorder. And I think this question of like what is disorder plays into all of these different forms of policing that we've discussed, whether it's gangs, whether it's sex work, whether it's politics, whether it's you know your existence on the street, guns, all of these things. And so I want to sort of ask first Alex, and again, if anybody else wants to jump in on this, to dig down into this issue of like, what do we mean when we say crime versus what do we mean when we say disorder? And why do we assume that the police exist to create and protect order? Yeah, as Melissa pointed out in my first book, City of Disorder, I, it was really my feeling that it was not so much the major crime problem that was driving the rise of neoconservative politics in New York, it was the unaddressed disorder. It was the squeegee men, the low-level drug dealing in the park, the, the young guys hanging out on the corner, public drinking, and that a lot of what got defined as disorder was, of course, racialized and very culturally specific. Mm -hmm. And wasn't, a lot of it wasn't illegal. But these communities wanted something done about it. And in some ways, there were parts of it that were reasonable. There were parks that couldn't be used because there were needles in them, because there were homeless people sleeping on the playgrounds. That's a real thing. The problem was is that what communities during that period were told was the only thing they can have to solve that problem is invasive and aggressive policing. And so by highlighting the fact that a lot of what the police do has nothing to do with the law, and that even what gets defined as illegal is politically motivated, allowed me to kind of hone in on this new expanded role of policing and the failure of the state to provide any real solutions to mass homelessness, to untreated mental illness, to youth joblessness, et cetera, et cetera. Anybody else wanna? Yeah, um, yeah I think, am I on or not? Okay, I'm yes. back, hi. I am the only mic that's, that's doing that, I apologize. <laughs> uh, th this question of, of disorder is, is one of the things that I used to tease out why people believe that the police are the solution to, to sex work, and I would say to street prostitution in particular. And there are even people who believe that, that all sex work should be decriminalized who still think that street prostitution or solicitation should remain a crime. And, and when you start to pull it apart, as you did, you're like, okay, well, what is the community angry about? Are they angry about people uh, hanging out on the streets at all hours? Could you address that some other way? Are people angry about condoms or needles? Could you address that some other way? Are they angry about men catcalling women? Well, that's gonna be a problem whether or not there are sex workers in your neighborhood. And P.S., if there are sex workers in your neighborhood, that's another woman on the street who has your back. 
So we could think about these things in a, in a broader way and think of solutions that, that aren't about criminalizing people. I also think a lot of this disorder rhetoric, like I have a hard time with it because I feel like what sometimes people mean by that is, or when they're responding to, when they're responding to what they say is disorderly, is they're responding to poverty. They just don't want to see poverty in their face. And, and that certainly cannot be addressed with policing. I know you have something to say about this. <laughs> no, no, yeah. I mean, I, I just, some people may know that I, you know, I and others were really focused on Commissioner Bratton when he was brought back to New York. Because this, this had a lot to do with the history of New York City. And mm -hmm. at the time, you know, we didn't want to make it about the man, but about the kind of legacy that he left behind. And I remember having read, unfortunately, I had to read some of his books. And I also had to read a lot of information about the creation of Broken Windows, the, the whole ideas. I read some of Alex's writings. And I just remember, and I, and I brought this up once before, <clears throat> to put it like, blunt, like to make it simple, when Brad has often explained the, the, the reason why they needed to do broken windows and, and, dis, and maintenance, uh, order maintenance policing. He said basically like, listen, you know, we've had a lot of excesses in the last 30 years. And when he said that, he was talking about the 60s and the 70s. He was talking about the mm -hmm. civil rights era. He was talking about a time when America was changing. And for him, this was someone that people point out, this is somebody who you know, was, was, was in the military, was a career cop, for him, his mind view, and Alex even explained this, I think, in the, in the neoconservative roots uh, article that you wrote about uh, how you, if you trace it back, the lineage to all of these thinkers, including James Q. Wilson, who wrote some, like, he wrote like the most blatantly racist stuff, like <laughs> what signs of disorder, yep. like interracial couples, or uh, a, a Negro wearing a conch in the street, or a girl with a miniskirt. Like, this is, this is the mind view. And I think for him, he was saying that, like, like, we're getting out of control. Liberalism is getting too out of control. It's, it's causing, right, the, the idea of broken was is these signs of disorder are causing the murders and the, and the shootings and stuff. So he's basically saying, liberalism is run amok and we need to take the streets back. And that was what I, that was what I got from him. It was like political calling to say basically these signs of disorder, and he wasn't gonna say black people, he wasn't gonna say immigrants or homeless people or, or, or street workers or what may have, but it was this, this signal to say like we are going to, with the, actually the help of liberals, right? The help of them, mm -hmm. a lot of liberals in New York City, mm -hmm. they voted for Giuliani. Mm -hmm. They voted for Mike Bloomberg three times. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, even here in progressive mm -hmm. New York City, they also, there's something, my personal opinion is, there's something in even white liberals that says they don't want these things around. And they don't want to, they don't even want to entertain, maybe they can academically entertain the causes of poverty, but they don't actually want to deal with the homeless person asking. So it's yeah. very convenient when like mm -hmm. Bratton and then a bunch of other like academic uh, uh, criminologists come out and say, well, these guys, this guy on the corner with the cup, he's actually the reason we have 3,000 murders in a year. And it's so convenient to think that way because it's just like, well, oh, now the solution is so simple, you know? 1999, you know, like the uh, three, three payments of 1999, it's like, it's like an infomercial for being able to push ahead um, what they did over the last 25 years. Where I live, I live in Newburgh, up the Hudson Valley a little bit, and a uh, few blocks from me is a place where the guys played checkers on the street all night. And like that makes me feel safer when there's the guys that you know on the street all night. So last year, one of them got shot. And the answer that the cops could come up with was get the guys to stop playing checkers on the street. And I was like, dude, the guy playing checkers on the street is the one that got shot here. He's not the problem. <laughs> anyway, any of y'all want to get on this? Or, okay. There'll be more. Yeah, yeah. All right, one more that I'm going to take my, my oh, privilege. Yep. Trump ran a campaign of backlash on many levels. One of them was about policing. It was specifically about, you know, Chicago disorder, but also, like, he was going to let the cops do whatever they wanted. So in the age of Trump, how have things changed from the organizing all of you were already doing or covering during the age of Obama? What's changed under Trump? Uh, it's a bad news, good news, bad news story in my mind. You know, the bad news is, is that uh, Trump has embraced a kind of theater of revenge and resentment that he is, you know, mobilizing symbolism of resentment and uh, racial animus, and that 
the solution to all our problems is even more heavy-handed policing. The good news is, is that that is mostly symbolic. The role of the federal government in law enforcement is actually quite limited. There was just a report today that the, the major federal law enforcement grant program, the Burn grant program, has no effect on local policing, despite giving out hundreds of millions of dollars. It, it, they're not able to turn that into actual programmatic changes, and that local places have their own motives for wanting to do something about policing. So that's the good news, is that this is a local problem in many places, and we can come up with local solutions. The, the bad news is, is that most of the solutions being discussed are the kinds of things that Joe's Mart just mentioned. How do we make them nicer? How do we give them more money for more technology and more training programs? How do we expand their reach into communities? How do we build the legitimacy of the police? Uh, rather than getting rid of the war on drugs and getting cops out of schools and stopping to criminalize you know, people in, involved in sex work and young people involved in black market activities in poor communities. Um, so there is an, a local opening, but we've got to advance the agenda. And of course, that's the number one goal for the book for me. Um, I, I think the practice hasn't necessarily been different in terms of whether or not Trump's election has me made any like um, in, in, uh, like made the police even more like rambunctious. Um, I, I don't think that's a question. I think I think the police are going to still be as uh, like horrible and and like violent to our communities. Um, however, I think that um, if anything from relate what, what happened around Trump, I think we're, we're seeing power consolidate at the state level, um, particularly when it comes to like budgets, right? When we, when we hear every day language from the federal government or even just from state governments around um, like all these immigrants are coming to take our jobs, all of these black people are like so violent and criminal. Um, I think we're seeing a little bit more of like the ways in which ICE and other department, law enforcement agencies collaborate in a little bit more of uh, intense ways than we've seen before. Um, and, and I think if even more that, that this is a call for like expanded sanctuary and like freedom cities, right? Like we need to be able to really just disattach ourselves in terms of the power and relates to ICE enforcement and police uh, occupation in our communities. Go ahead. Go. Just really quickly, my mantra since Trump has come into office, particularly when it con concerns law and order and the kind of fantasy of law and order, the, the 70s New York that Trump seems to still live in in his head, and uh, for him, everything, it's, everything is everything, right? Like, I didn't really cover immigration until Trump. And the reason I'm covering immigration now is because in Trump's sort of naughty list, the, you know, his axis of evil that he's always rolling out uh, are traffickers and gangs, traffickers and gangs and immigrants, traffickers and gangs. And, and you know, it, whether that was his speech where he told members of law enforcement not to be too nice yeah. to people that mm -hmm. they were arresting, whether that's his attacks on MS-13, even though the harshest result of those uh, the attempts to police MS-13 as a gang are falling on brown communities. So why? Why is he saying everybody is under the same criminal umbrella? What is the power of that? That's something I'm still trying to figure out. And mm -hmm. I agree that uh, it hasn't been very effective, right? His entire presidency hasn't been very effective in terms of changing policy and practice. But the symbolic effect, we know that ICE and Customs and Border Patrol feel like the gloves are off now. Right. And that's creating a lot of fear in immigrant communities and communities of color. And that I don't know how to address. Um, in the same way that you know we can attack a police budget or something tangible, because it's the symbolic and and fear mongering um, that he is successful at. Yeah, I would just add one thing. Um, you know, everything Trump says is horrible. Uh, it's just a daily onslaught, and it's terrible, and the like. It's really overt, um, and we just need to make sure that we're not only working to get rid of that really overt, terrible thing that's happening all the time. Uh, you know, the, the surveillance state that's now being used against the protesters uh, was built under Obama. As um, was the immigration The deportation state. machine yeah. that is being used was built under Obama. Yep. Uh, 
you know, those, yep. they, and they were being used. Um, yep. You know, the murders of Eric Garner, uh, you know, the murders of Mike Brown, uh, the non-indictments of those police officers, all of that happened under Obama. Uh, the reaction was the policing I talked about earlier uh, of the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, not, uh, you know, yep. heavier, uh, not, yep. not defunding of police forces, right? Um, so the solutions weren't coming under Obama either. Now, uh, you know, I'm, I'm both excited that people are getting involved and upset about the things that Trump says on a daily basis, but I'm concerned that people will only want to get rid of that. Absolutely. And if we only get, if we're only pushing back against that, that's Absolutely. really problematic. We've got to push back against the roots of it, the things that were expanded under Obama, and really attack it at the at the root. Yeah. Do you want to jump in on this one, or should we take some audience questions? All right, so we're going to take, I think somebody has a wireless mic for the audience, right? All right, so we're going to take three questions at a time and then toss them back to the crowd. I think I definitely saw a hand up way in the back there, like way early on.